Um, I, I was trying to think if there's a more pretentious title that I could use. <laughs> as I have infinite amount of experience with the Ivy League coming from Syracuse. Um, but I didn't, so I'm just going to go with it. And There you go. Um, I'd like to start today with actually referring to someone you probably know, a fellow by the name of Bill Arms. Bill Arms and, and what is he, computer science, I suppose? Uh, we were at a, a conference, some of you may know I play around in virtual reference from time to time, and we were putting together a conference on the research agenda, and we invited Bill and a couple other people, and we were having lunch. And, and Bill said, you know, I'm wondering. He says, imagine that your college has a new president, new chancellor, new president, new head of mucky muck. And each college is invited to show their star, invites to have their star come in and really talk about why they're important to the campus. So the physicists pick that Nobel laureate guy, and you know, the economists have their awards, and the, the humanities have their awards. He goes, what does the school of virtual reference bring up? You know, what's that, what are they going to say that they did? That not only one is very important, but is recognized as very important by everyone else in that room. And so I, I, I really like this thought experiment, and I apply it to just about everything in my life, so like my eight-year-olds are getting tired of hearing about it, but um, you know, what is it that if you're, you looked at library science and the new, the new president comes in and everyone's there and we say, all right, the libraries, send us forth your star. What is it that they're going to say that they have done that's a fundamental contribution that has not only increased the, the good environment of the campus, but has really pushed forward knowledge in a way that's recognizable by other disciplines? And I think that's a really interesting question. Because when we talk about outputs and we talk about outcomes and we talk about impacts and we talk about all of these things, and we gather our statistics, I think sometimes as a field we forget to ask the most fundamental question, which is what is that unique contribution that we make? And why does it belong in an Ivy League school? Frankly, why does it belong in any school? It could be asked about any community. Because I'm, I'm very much a believer that libraries and library science, that we have much more in common than we do in what separates us by public and academic and special and this and that. So the question is, what is library science doing here? And is there really a science? Now, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try and answer that question from some of the research and work that we've been doing. But ultimately, my job and my guess is what you're going to be spending this week on is trying to answer that question on an ongoing basis for you. And I'm sure you have been working on this on an ongoing basis. But, so with that, what I'd like to do is just sort of give you a little bit of my answer. Maybe. There we go. About two years ago now, uh, the American Library Association's Office for Information and Technology, which sees itself as really a think tank in information policy, was looking at some policy work and some interesting moves in Washington, and they said uh, there was this interesting piece of legislation called DOPA, and never a better name for a piece of legislation ever, <laughs> the Leading Online Predators Act. And it was the time of the MySpace phenomenon where we all knew that the only reason MySpace existed was for seven-year-olds and the 47-year-olds who wanted the seven-year-olds, and we all got together online, and it was horrible. And so what we need to do is ban this thing. But we can't write a piece of law saying, thou shalt not MySpace. So they looked around for a piece of legislation they could work with, and they said, hey, look at this little thing that says that public libraries and K-12 schools have to filter. Oh, there's been a silly omission here that we haven't told you what you have to filter. We'll just go ahead and change that. We're going to tell you the kinds of sites that we want you to filter. Once again, we can't write MySpace into it, so we'll use something like social networking, but we don't quite know what that is. And so we'll use something like interactive website, but that means too much, so don't worry about it. We'll just form a committee after we pass the law that will tell you what you need to filter. <laughs> now, good news is the law died. Bad news is it comes up every so often. It's coming up in state levels. But what it really began was a thinking process going, you know, you know the show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Are you smarter than your legislative representative? <laughs> because it really became a question about how, what, how do you define this stuff? You know, when, when you, two years ago, Flickr and MySpace and this and that, it was, it was really the peak of the second bubble of, of Web 2.0. 
And how do we put a definition to it? And so ITP, in their wisdom, said, you know, let's look ahead. And they said, Dave, would, would you and my colleague Joanne Silverstein and Scott Nicholson start looking ahead? And we did what we, everyone does, which is the bad dictionary project of this is what a mashup is, and this is what Ajax is, and this is whatever. And it just was a mess. And we're trying to figure out what's going on here. And at one point we said, well, you know, what's interesting, what's going on here is it's collection development. Except instead of collecting stuff, we're collecting friends, you know? We have friends, and what do we do with them? I don't know, but we have them. I mean, tell me, <laughs> tell me it doesn't sound like some of the collection development policies you've heard of. We've got them all. What are they? I don't know, but aren't they beautiful? <laughs> we said, oh, that's not quite what's going on. What's happening here? And as we looked at it, we came across what's happening here is that people are trying to shape the world around them. When they go on to the web and when they see stuff on the web, they want to have a say in what it looks like and how it works. When they go online and they, they read something that you said, they want to respond. When they read a book and, they want to, and you tell them what you think, they want to tell you what they think. And what's happening here is not necessarily a drive for being social. I mean, maybe it's because Joanne and I are basically anti-social people that we looked at this and said, there's got to be something more than just people wanting to talk. You know, social, it, it sounds like MySpace is a good disco hookup, but that's not what's going on. What's happening here? And so what we've tried to figure out, people are, Learning, and we came across this wonderful thing called conversation theory, which we're going to talk a little bit about. But what it says is, when people seek to know something, when people seek to understand something, when people seek to learn, they seek out conversation. And knowledge is created through this conversation process. And I'll break that down a little bit more. Now, if libraries are in the knowledge business, and I think few of us would argue that. I mean, unless you really feel vehemently like you're going to jump up and say, no, damn it, we're in the thing business. Really, we're in the stuff business. We're in the beautiful buildings with leather business. Beautiful buildings with leather. Maybe a whole different business. Um, <laughs> we're in the knowledge business. Therefore, libraries are in the conversation business. So that, that was what came out of that paper and it talked about technology and the fact that catalogs had to change and all this other stuff. But what I want to do is I want to dissect that in a little bit more detail because you have every right to be skeptical about what I mean by that. So the first thing to know is conversation is not a metaphor. When I say that knowledge is created through conversation, I don't mean it's created through a like conversation kind of sort of whatever process. I mean it's literally created through a process of a conversation and how we define them. And this is a fellow by the name of Gordon Pask, a cybernetician from the 60s and 70s, who sought to teach machines how to think. And what he did was he started by figuring out how people think and then tried to replicate it in hardware at the time. And what he said is, conversation is how we do this. And conversation is, 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 consists of a couple of parts. And I'm going to break them down. Conversance, language, agreements, and entailment meshes. So, follow my logic for a moment. If libraries are in the knowledge business, and knowledge is an active dynamic process which is gained through a process called conversation, and libraries are therefore in the conversation business, what does that mean? What business are we facilitating? Well, let's break these down one by one. And let's start by talking about the first thing we need, our conversants. When you're having a conversation, you need at least two players, right? Now, Notice that first bullet says two or more cognitive agents. See, we're in the Ivy League, so I've got to use big, long words. <laughs> I once gave a speech right after an English uh, Berkeley professor, and it was just like, look, I'm, I'm not going to know more, but I can at least be more passionate about it. So um, two or more cognitive agents. Why don't I just call those people? Because in conversation theory and how it works, it's not just people. This is a conversation. It's a very one-sided conversation, but lots of things are actually happening now. Like as I'm looking around, people are doing this and right, whatever it is. And there'll be questions and answers and all that stuff. So th this is a conversation. Communities can have conversations. When the library goes to buy a new piece of software and you enter into a negotiation with a vendor, you're entering into a very structured conversation. Country, countries can have conversations, right? Now there's a lot of conversations about who's allowed in Miramar and who's not. And how can we have that conversation? But it can go the other way too, which is an individual can actually have a conversation internally. Now, if you're into instruction at all, you know this as metacognition or critical thinking. 
It's what we try to teach people to do is they're learning something to be aware of the fact they're learning and how they're learning it. I mean, much of what we do in reference in public service, for example, is actually attempting to have a conversation one-to-one, -one, but really what we're trying to do is prompt an internal conversation so the next time they go and do this, they're thinking, oh, this is what an academic journal is. This is why people care about it, right? These two agents need to pay attention. This is very important, because right? I, once again, well, oh, bringing up Bill Arms, you've got to be really clear. They both have to listen. Um, they both have to go back and forth. You know Bill. You both have to know, go back and forth. You know, it can't just be shouting at someone. There's got to be some attempt to stop, pause, hear, understand. So that means there's turn taking involved. And there's a whole discussion about language and linguistics and how conversations occur. And that gets into gender roles and power roles and really great theory on that. And it happens over time. And that time could be seconds, could be milliseconds, could be centuries. Well, some could still argue we're having the conversation that Aristotle started, that we're still going through what is life and what's it about. So these conversations can be very protracted. Now, how do we make this real? Because I've been a, I'm on leave this year, which is to take these wonderful 30,000 foot ivory tower ideas and make them very concrete and real. And so I spent some time at the Department of Justice's law libraries. And the Department of Justice said, come, we're, we have to buy a new online system. Come help us think about online system, a new catalog. And something very interesting occurred. Their catalog was down, and I'd love to say I'm making this up. Their catalog was down for a month. How many complaints did they get? <laughs> Their service population was greater than five, by the way. It was around 350. What's going on here? Is it that no one liked the library? No, these were avid users of the library. What was going on was that the lawyers that they were serving never used the catalog. They talked to the librarians. So they'd send an email saying, I need this book. I don't care where you get it from. I don't care if it's on a shelf downstairs. Your job is to go get it, whether you have to go to the Library of Congress or go three feet away from you. And there was this relation set up where the librarians actually built this. They, they, this was a good thing because this meant that the librarians and the lawyers had a relationship going that was very important. All right? So what we started doing, instead of looking at how the catalog is, is we started mapping up out of the organization. Now, you can't read this, nor do I pretend that you can. What we started doing is saying, look, we have some communities going on here. This top community are the legal staff, the lawyers. And what they're doing is they're trying to set up a case. And we found a regularity. When a lawyer is going to do a case, what they worry about first is they worry about legislative intent. If I'm going to apply this law in court, I want to know what this law was intended to do. So we do legislative histories. Do we have any Cornell lawyer librarian types? No, they're all in their separate world. All right. Um, I'm, they're just jokes, really. Just <clears throat> So they're out doing legislative histories, they want to hear hearings, they want to know why this law was. Then what they do is they begin to develop a brief. And the brief consists of a theory of the case, what I think it applies, and how the evidence fits into it. And what's interesting about this process is they start very wide. Lawyers want everything. And then as they come up with the theory of the case, they quickly narrow down. Right? Now what's interesting to them is that the end result of that brief production is a document called a brief which goes through a very formal submission process. Anything that didn't find its way into a brief, the lawyer considers irrelevant. The librarians, on the other hand, think that's gold. I mean, this was a lot of interesting stuff they found out. So then what happens is they work on the life of the law. Okay, did the law get exempted? What, were the, what, what happened in court? What were the court cases decided? What's the precedent, et cetera? And then what we did is, all right, that's community number one. Then we have the librarians, and we started asking, how do we map the resources and services we have to that conversation? And then we talk about the idea of, here are the vendors. Here are other legal sources of information outside of the Department of Justice. And here is the general audience and how these things map. And so we could begin to lay down what services were the, were the librarians providing, not who came into the library, what did they want from the library. What we could see is this is the conversation that this agency has defined as the most important conversation. How did you justify your existence by supporting it? And how can you directly show me evidence? We took the same process and we went to another academic library and we began laying out the same planning process. They wanted to come up with the mission statement. And what we did, rather than saying, we're a library, what do we got? And what's useful? 
is we started with a simple process and said, what communities are out there that are talking to each other? We have faculty, we have staff, we have the librarians themselves, we have administrators, we have all these things. We laid them out. And then we began to say, all right, what conversations are they having? Well, the faculty in this college was going through a big discussion about what is the, the liberal arts core, the core. And I said, all right, how many librarians are seeing, if this is the most important conversation, how many librarians are seeing at the table of the core conversation? Okay, what's, you know, and we began to lay it out. One of the main conversations staff was having, daycare. And so the question became, can we as a library do anything about daycare? And they said, no, we, this is not something we want to do. Okay, so you begin to say, what are the conversations, what are the, what are the current potential impacts of these conversations, and how do we want to apply them? I was in a public library where they were very much about economic development. For them, daycare is really important because when they look at a lot of single moms coming in to start small businesses, the number one problem they have is daycare. And the public library started a daycare center to release the mothers to have time to do the work in economic development. Right? So different communities in different contexts, different conversations, how can we support them? That's very different than what do we do and how does it impact people? It really is, what are they talking about, and how do we promote or send it forward? Now, besides the conversants, the other thing we've got going on is language. So what are these conversants doing? They're sending language back and forth. Yeehaw. Now, this is where I get, once again, all academic on you. And there are two types of language that we can talk about. There's L0 language and L1 language. Think of this as naive and instructed, or expert. So when people are having, when you folks have a, a discussion about librarianship amongst yourself, you're having an L1 conversation, which means you can ask questions where you sort of assume they know something in the back of their mind. So you can say things like cataloging and not have to stop and back up and explain what that was, right? Hopefully. You can say things, right, what this resource, what that resource. Yet L0 is what a lot of our users bring to this system, right? L0 is the idea that they come and say, I want a book. Right? They don't know more than the book. And so what we ultimately do is we help them move ahead. This is like when you go to really bad training and they say click here, then click here, then click here. And you just want to say why, 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 right? Click here, click here, click here is an L0 conversation. Why, so that you understand why you're doing it, is an L1 conversation. Now, what I want you to think about for a moment is right now in our library systems, we have language embedded within them. Within, not only do we have a language embedded within our systems, we have a conversation embedded within our systems. And I'll choose the most obvious. The most obvious is when we put materials into our systems, we classify them. We classify them probably LCSH is my guess, right? That's a conversation. It's a conversation around the question, how is the world organized, right? Do we have that conversation? How do I see the world? Right? Well, if you're a Christian text, you see it really clearly, and if you're anything else, you're way down here. Right? We can embed lots of stuff in these conversations. We can embed power in these conversations. We can embed gender. We can embed biases. We can embed all this other stuff, but it's a conversation. Right? Now, what's interesting is we reduce the world to a single conversation. So this is an example of, imagine I sent you into Grand Central Station at the height of rush hour and I told you to record every conversation that was going on. What would you do? Well, if you were you know, bold enough, what you'd do is you'd stand up and you'd say, all right, business on this side, personal on this side, medical on this side, legal on this side, and you begin subdividing the groups until you got to, first of all, stop talking Remember what you said, and then I'm going to come group by group, and I'm going to write that down. Right? That's how we do it in the physical world, because we have to put these things someplace. Now, every day, you engage in a radically different way of organizing conversations. As you speak here, thousands upon thousands of radio signals are going through your body, from cell phones to radio stations to television, and there are conversations going on on those frequencies, but they don't interfere with this one. So what you do is you get a special piece of technology called a radio, and you tune in the one you want to hear. You can even co-locate them right next to each other. Right? Technology enabled us to allow multiple simultaneous conversations where noise is OK because we can filter out the noise we don't want to hear. And yet, that same technology is available to us online, 
But what do we do? No noise. Noise reduction. Get rid of the noise. One conversation. Right? Now, what's interesting with this language thing is it leads to different kind of systems. One system is the static system. This is a system that has L1 and L0 users and never the twain shall meet. What Gordon Pask was interested in was learning systems where you started at L0 and it, the system itself brought you up to a higher understanding. Then there are participatory systems, which I'll talk about in a second. So what's interesting, here's the classic example of a static system. You thought I was bringing up the catalog, didn't you? <laughs> Think about this box, this wonderful box, this glorious, mysterious, romantic box that we now all aim for. This is, let's face it folks, you guys have the one box. You do have the one box, right? You probably even call it the Google box somewhere. Do you remember when the world had to be broken down into 13 categories because Yahoo did it? You know? Okay. Um, what's interesting about this box? It's a, it's a static system. Now, you guys know that you can do amazing things with this box. You can put quotes and minuses and tildes and, and plus signs and you can in essence do, let's face it, a dialogue search in the Google box and twist this thing to your own petty needs, right? You have an L1 understanding of this box. You have a, you have a, a much more advanced knowledge of this box. But average users don't. So they plug in education, right? <laughs> I'm a physics student. Physics. <laughs> right? And we go, of course this is crap. They get crappy results. And so what do we do as libraries? We build a learning system. We call it bibliographic instruction. Please, God, don't call it that anymore. We call it instruction, right? We spend a huge amount of time, I'm looking at these posters, about showing up and trying to bring people from an L0 world to an L1 world. And we've taken that on as a task of ours. And I don't think that's a bad idea. But I think that's what we need to realize, is that by what we're doing is not solving the L1, L0 problem by turning our catalogs into this. We're simply making it a more well understood L0, L1 static system that people bring. And it still brings the back results that confuse the hell out of them. Right? Why does Google results not confuse the hell out of people? There's so many to choose from. Right? Now, think about an interesting learning system. Think about games. I don't know if you're a gamer. We have a library game lab at Syracuse, Scott Nicholson, doing brilliant stuff. I like playing games. A major shift in games. It used to be when you bought a game of any complexity, you would get a manual of equal complexity. And you had to read through the manual to figure out how to play it. You don't anymore. If you go buy a PlayStation game or you go buy something for your computer, if it has a manual, it is irrelevant. Because what they, people have learned is the first level of the game is the teaching level. If you've ever played Myst, and I know this is an old example, but I still think it's one of the best. Myst was a wonderful game where it literally dropped you in the middle of an island and said, enjoy. No idea what the objective was, no idea how to do it. You just moved around. Right? There's, what's interesting is this is a, a game called Flow. And it was the most popular game downloaded on PS3s. PlayStation 3, heavy graphic duty engine, can you know, do megapixels per second, blah, 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 geography engine, physics simulation, rah, rah, rah. This was the number one game people downloaded. And I'm not kidding you when I say this is the game that people downloaded. And so that's you in the middle, Whee! and you eat things, Whee! and notice by the way, credits going by, oh, I guess we'll do this. What happens if I do that? Whee! All right? And you got to be careful because I could be here for the rest of the day. <laughs> um, and what happens is eventually you go down in levels and you meet other guys like you that you can eat. And you begin to notice that you get like antennae going and you get bigger and longer and the farther you go down. And what's interesting is this was a PhD research. And what the PhD research was, was in attention. And what the, the reason they call it flow is they said, you know, once people get engaged in systems, they enter into this sort of other consciousness where they're just sort of flowing along with information and they sort of set, tune out a lot of literal stuff and tune in just experiencing and learning the rules sort of haptically, right? Well, this is interesting because you don't, there's nowhere in here to give you instructions for the game. It just, you played the game. 
And so you'll see incre increasingly in games, that's how it works, is we don't instruct you in the games, you just play the games and you learn. Now there's a third alternative, which really the web, oh my goodness, excuse me a moment. My guy's still eating in the back, okay. Um, you saw the background? Um, what we found in Web 2.0 systems, and Flickr, this is Flickr, you can find it in MySpace and things like that, is what's interesting is they're very, very shallow in terms of functionality. If you actually go in and look at Flickr, or you go in and you look at MySpace, they don't have a lot of this upright wizards to walk you through thing functionality. They do pretty simple stuff. I can put up a post, I can put up my friends thing, I can add an application in, that kind of thing. But what they are is they're heavy on customizability. So people can't necessarily do much with the simple individual tool, but they can modify the hell out of it. And what you're finding is people are putting their own language in the system. What are these tags? These tags are their language, their understanding, their classification. And it turns out if you let lots of people use their own language and their own classification and their own organization scheme, that when you combine them, Interesting and good things happen. Tag clouds. People tend to use the same terms for the same ideas. You get a much quicker understanding of a topic. You get all this interesting action. But it, they're not necessarily doing it because they're social beings. They're not necessarily doing it because, oh, gee, I want to help out the world. They're doing it because they're shaping the world around them. They're learning. And as they learn, they're seeking out conversation. They're seeking out participation. They're seeking out customization. And it turns out that if you aggregate all those individual selfish activities, you get public goods out of them. Right? So yes, our systems, not too much. They're L1, L0, and static. And so what's interesting, we'll get into it in a second, when you try and apply this logic to a system that's built on this logic, things don't go well. All right, moving on. So we have conversance and they're sharing language. What are they sharing language to do? They're sharing language to come up with agreements. What they're doing is they're negotiating meaning. Now, once again, in forums like this where we have a very shared common background and graduate education and all speak the same language, the agreements we can come up to are very high level. So when I say things like, does that make sense? These are just verbal cues of me trying to look for heads nodding or whatever it is to seek agreement. By the way, you can agree not to agree. Right? But what we're doing is we're seeking these agreements and we're scaffolding knowledge on top of these agreements, which is, okay, if you understand this, then now you should be able to understand this. And if you understand this, then you should be able to understand this. Right? Now, I bring up licensing problem. You're going, what the hell is that all about? Remember when I said that organizations can, can have conversations and come to agreements. What's interesting is I, in the library world, increasingly I hear a huge frustration around the concept of licensing. But what is a license? A license is a very, very formal agreement, which is the outcome, an artifact of a conversation. And increasingly we're having problems because what we're doing is we're bringing this same artifact over and over and over again. So I have a good friend who's a vendor in the library science side and he says he gets extraordinarily frustrated because what happens is he'll talk with people and is this what you want in the system? Yes. Is this what you want? Yes. And then they'll bring out the contract that they borrowed from their other consortium partner, which contradicts half of that, and they tie him into it. And then they wonder, why is he being agile and coming up with brand new stuff all the time? Because I'm violating what we just agreed to. And it's gotten to the point right now where it's so complex that people are talking about scrapping licensing altogether and there's a NISO move to come up with more or less a standard of agreement, which isn't a license. It's like we'll agree to talk. Right? So that's just one example of how agreements are important. Now where do we store all these agreements? In something that past calls an entailment mesh, you and I can call memory. Right? And what is it? It's a collection of agreements plus their relationships, and it's dynamic. And this is very important. He would talk, the past by the word, way uses the word knowing versus knowledge, because knowledge sounds like it's set. And he says nothing's ever set. Right? Have you ever read a book and then gone back five years later and read the same book and realized that you had a totally different experience with it? 
you thought that that one scene was like 20 pages and it was half a page, or you didn't realize what they were really talking about, all that. Because our knowledge evolves and changes. Every time we come back to something, we come back with a whole sort of new world to it. But what's important about this is that it's dynamic and that it's an arrangement. Let me show you what I mean. Here are a bunch of pictures. Ta-da. Right? Now, we can classify these, we can mark them, we can do whatever we want with them. And in fact, you know, this is not radically different than you looking at your digitized collection saying, look, a bunch of stuff, yay! Right? What is this, what are the relationships of these concepts? I'll give you a hint. Guesses? Yeah. That's my dad. That's my mom. They had two children. I married my wife. That's my first son. That's my second son. That's what we look like now. Right? Now, the same objects. In this one, I represent them with context, with relationships. Let me give you a better example. James Burke, my favorite historian ever, and a broadcaster, did a series in the 70s called Connections, and then the day the universe changes. He writes authors. And he tells a really interesting view of history. And he tells the story of how the North winning the US Civil War led to the modern computer revolution. All right, here we go. I can get this down to like a minute if I do it really quickly. The South should have won the war. By common military standards of the day, the more men you can marshal to the field, the greater your chance of victory, and the South was more populous in the agrarian world. However, the North, by happenstance of circumstance, had greater industry. Greater industry means they could do more metalwork. Greater metalwork means they could produce more artillery and cannons. And so when the no South marshaled their troops, the North could marshal their smaller troops with greater artillery, which turns out turned the tide of battle. The problem with artillery is you can't just point a cannon at someone and go boom and knock them down because it works on a ballistic trajectory, which means you have to adjust the angle to find the right arc to kill them at the right distance. In order to calculate this, you need to understand what the area under an arc is, which is calculus. Not many northern troops, not many professors know calculus that well. And so what they used to do is when they would develop the cannons, they would get a bunch of mathematicians into a room, which they called computers, who would calculate distance trajectory, arc, gunpowder, and come up with a chart. Now when the northern soldier went to fire the cannon, all he had to do was say, they're that far away, measure it up, boom, fire. This changed how war worked. Now greater artillery meant greater chance of victory. This held true during the World War I and World War II. The problem in World War II is we were facing Germany and Germany's allies in the Axis, which was as good, if not a greater industrial power than the US. And so it led to an arms race where we produced more and more and bigger and bigger and greater and greater artillery. And we ran out of people because we couldn't calculate these charts fast enough, so we needed an automated way to do it. So we developed something called ENIAC, which looked at digital computing, which worked with vacuum tubes. The problem with vacuum tubes is they're very fragile. And so insects used to get into the systems that would blow up the vacuum tube, which is where the term computer bug came from. So we needed a way to replace vacuum tubes, which ate a lot of energy. And it turns out if you wafer silicon together, you get something called a transistor, which takes lots of less energy and lots less prone to bugs. And it turns out that you can shrink silicon smaller and smaller until you can get hundreds, thousands, and millions on the head of a pin, which led to the integrated circuit, which led to the modern computer um, central processing unit, which is sitting in the middle of this computer, which led to the modern computer revolution. Now. Civil War, field artillery, analytic mechanics, military history, electronics and computers, over to electronic apparatus, down to computer engineering, computer hardware, over to computer science, right? This is not linear. The conversation I just had, the way that, that Burke understood that transition, first of all, is not causal. But what it is, it's an integrative approach. It's a connection of lots of different artifacts and lots of ideas brought together, as opposed to breaking them up into lots of little chunks. And so what this is, is when we look at our catalogs, remember when I said, take social things, apply to catalog, not good things happen? This is one approach, lists, right? Lists, what do we do? Well, what we'll do is we'll let people work into our catalogs and we'll let them make a list. So as they find good books, they can do a list of my books. Funny thing about a list, 
you have no idea what the list is useful for, right? Have you ever, delicious kind of drives me nuts because you can look at delicious and see everyone's bookmarks, but you don't under, necessarily understand why they chose the bookmarks. The worst thing, we learned a long time we came up with, we don't do bibliographies in library of science, we do annotated bibliographies because what it does is it relates materials together. We understand the relation to them. It's the same thing with tagging. What we do with tagging is, well, we'll go into our books and we'll tag these books with my term, so a folksonomy will work. Well, here's the trick. Tagging is cool, but it's chronologically problematic, which means you tag based on current cognitive understandings of the world, which means if I give you a picture and I ask you for 10 tags and I come back a year later and I give you the same picture, you will not come up with the same 10 tags. You couldn't even necessarily explain why you use, well, you're human beings. You will come up with a seemingly rational explanation for those 10 tags, <laughs> even if they're not true. Right? So what happens is all too often we see people attempting to socialize the catalog. And what they're trying to do is embed this conversational approach, this L1 crazy language entailment mesh view of how we understand the world and apply it to a very simple, overly simplified system called a catalog. And it breaks down because catalogs are inventory systems. They tell you where a book is. They don't tell you which book you should read. That's why, and don't tell me you haven't done it, you go to Amazon first, find the book you want, grab the ISBN number, and go back to your catalog. Because Amazon does something different. How many times have you been in a meeting where you've looked at the system and you've said, all right, catalog sucks. We need a new catalog. Or the website sucks, or whatever it is. And it almost invariably turns into, it's got to be more like Google or more like Amazon. Oh, it's got to be more like Amazon. How so? It's got to be simpler. It's got to be easier. We got too much stuff there. We got to simplify it. Tell me you haven't had those conversations. I want to show you a trick. I hope. Okay. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. This is the entire bibliographic record for that book on WorldCat. Yeah, you can read it at your leisure. Right? <laughs> So this isn't just the first screen, this is, it takes the whole picture, okay? Same book, Onondaga County Public Library, National Library of Australia, Library of Congress, ready? Amazon. Simpler, less stuff. <laughs> What's going on here? What's going on here? Well, let's look at what, oh, it's all that marketing stuff. They're just out to make a buck. Well, let's look at it. That top itty bitty little band up there is marketing and navigation. That's where you get to search, that's where you get to choose books, that's where you get to see Amazon. That next little itty bitty box, that's sales information, which is bibliographic information. It's the cost, it's the author, it's the title. Next little one is uh, sales recommendations. If you like this, you'll like that. Next one, quality reviews. New York Times book review, you know, book list, LJ, that kind of stuff. Next one, straight bibliographic data. And what's interesting, if you add that orange bar and that light blue bar, you're actually not far off of these. So what else is going on here? More recommendations based on what you've already purchased. Open reviews. Conversations. What you see here is pathfinders. Remember when we did pathfinders? Discussion tools, wikis, blogs. And only at the very bottom do you have additional marketing information. The vast majority of this information is about conversations. It's about people in their own language and their own expertise and their own background not talking about just that book, but what the meaning of that book is. If you read, pick 10 random Amazon reviews, I will guarantee you that at least one and probably 50% of them are talking about more than just that book. So in the Sorcerer's Stone, you'll see things like, oh, you got to read the first one. I can't believe how J.K. Rowling set up book number two and book number seven with the first book. Are they talking about the first book? Or are they talking about the series? And it's interesting, all this data, by the way, helps you search and find these materials much more than this. Because if you search Harry Potter here, you're going to find it over and over and over and over and over again. Here you're going to find it once in the title. Right? Because our abstracts don't mention Harry Potter a lot, because that's not good abstracting. Right? By the way, if you're saying, Dave, you stack the deck, you're picking the Harry Potter, this is the woodwork of J woodcuts of J.J. Lankis, not related, um, from 1990. 
right, on Amazon. Right? Check this one out. Citations. They actually do citations. Isn't it amazing that we have long known that we are in the business of scholarly communication? Why is it that when someone comes up for tenure, the first thing they want to know is what their citation impact is? Because what they're trying to prove is not that they get cited a lot, though that's good, but that they have had an impact on the field, that they have furthered the conversation. Why is it if scholarly communication is so fundamental to academic libraries that we deal with the front of the book, which describes what's written, and not the back of the book, which is citations and indexing and connection to the rest of it? Why do we spend a quarter of a million to a million dollars on Web of Science for people where they, our, our academics value it, and we spend all the money on cataloging on the title of the book? Just a thought. Conversations. Let me show you another example. We worked on the uh, reserve section at SU, and what we wanted to do is think about how can we take these ideas and make it real. So we started with electronic reserves. I'm sure your site looks oh so much better than this, but I'm going to pick on myself for a moment. So the first thing you want to do to find a reserve is you go to find a reserve, which makes a lot of sense. By the way, I always love the idea of search the catalog because that means you're looking for sweaters and socks. All right. So we're going to find it. So we end up with this page, and we pick our instructor, and we pick our department, our course, and it spits us back a page that looks like this. Yeah, until we got sued, now we got to put it in, or threatened to be sued, so we got to put it in Blackboard, but same idea. Like they were going to sue us. All right, so we went through and we said, all right, how could we redesign this system using these conversational concepts? And we started with, well, for the first thing is, I pay enough to SU, they should know who I am, why do I have to tell you every time? And we came up with a page that looks like this. Now, we have my articles, my books, my classes, my feeds, my stuff, my friends, got to have friends, it's Web 2.0. Here's the thing, here's the, the basic information about it. We stole this from library things, so you want to know who else has to read the book. We want to put our virtual reference librarian in there. We've got to have a tag cloud. Tag clouds are cool. Got to have a tag cloud. And then down here at the bottom, we've got an Amazon. So it's a mashup. This thing screams Web 2.0. This thing screams functionality. Clearly, this is better. And we looked at this and said, no, what is this? We started calling this the PDF aggrandizement screen. <laughs> because what is this screen about? This screen is about that, not about the person who's reading it or how they're using it. It's not about the conversation. What is the difference between an article and a book to a student assigned a reading in a class? It's still something they've got to do. It's still something they've got to find. Oh, one has a binding that I'm never going to see because I'm only going to read the abstract. And the other is online full text, right? And what is, you know, aren't books and classes part, or books and articles part of classes? And, you know, what, why do I need friends in this? So we went back and we said, no, this is, we need to do a better job of this. And we came up with this. I want to explain this for a minute. So first of all, we have my conversations. My conversations may be about a class. They may be about uh, the great American novel I want to write. They're about something. And when I look into it, what is more fundamental that we do in academia as a conversation than the class? That's what a class is. A class is where we invite students in to learn about a topic. And how do we have them learn? We have them learn by engaging an expert, supposedly, in a conversation. And the instructor formalizes that conversation by saying, here's what I want you to know. Here's the order in which I want you to know it. Here are the readings and materials I want. And so why is it in a reserves, we take the syllabi, we strip out all of the conversation, just keep the stuff part of it. We've lopped off the top of the tree that makes that stuff make sense. So why not put the syllabus number one? And the syllabus says, read this and read that. And by the way, some assignments. And now right within the same stu system, the student can begin putting their assignments in so it becomes an electronic portfolio at the same time. And not only that, but they can look at this book and say, well, who else is, I'm going to keep notes on this book's online. So I can annotate this. And I can say, who else in my class is annotated? So if they're willing to share, I can now read the notes for my entire class. But then I can keep going and say, did you know that this book, I see notes in here from someone in, I'm taking information science and they're in anthropology. What's going on here? Why is this book being used in anthropology? Well, it's both about understanding the world. And so suddenly, you're connecting conversations not by, this is information science, this is anthropology. You're connecting them by conversation. 
You're connecting the threads of knowledge, not simply archiving the stuff. If you click on one of those items, then you get the magical book aggrandizement page. That still makes sense, but now it's in context. Because here's the real trick. We used to say that content is king. It's not. It's at best a lowly prince. Context is king. Books, articles, web pages, CDs, these are merely artifacts. These are pale afterglows of knowledge. It is only when we look at them with a point of view, when we look at them in context, that they take on meaning, that they take on importance. We learned a long time ago when we cataloged materials, we used to honestly tell ourselves that we were simply emerging the facts from the book and in an unbiased way describing them. Forget it. Cataloging is where we apply a description to something, and it is not inherent in the something. Melville Dewey, master of library science, misogynist, anti-Semite, central New York professor. Whatever, right? These are all contexts of which we come to know this artifact called the Dewey Decimal System, or the book. What is the context that we can bring to this? How can we understand it? What is the conversation? And what this allows us to begin to do is migrate out of the stuff business into the conversation business. Leave the catalog alone. It's fine. It tells us where the books are. Don't mess with it. Right? Where you put your tagging and where you put your conversations and where you put your lists and where you put the threads, you build that in a separate system that sits on top of the catalog. The catalog's not dead or useless. It's a good inventory system. It's when you go to buy a shoe. And you say, do you have this in a size 8? And the sales clerk disappears behind a desk and searches and says, yes, we have it. Right? What do we do as librarians? I don't know. Good luck. Right? They're the same thing. We make it our primary interface. What's my library about? Stuff. How do I know? That's all it's what you go look for. And by the way, you have a picture of a building on front. That really makes it stuff. Now, what's interesting is this becomes a great way of looking at an opportunity. Because what we know is that knowledge is created constructively. The way we understand things is by scaffolding conversations and relating knowledge together. What theory does in science is it becomes a construct that explains fact and helps us predict. It is by its very nature building something. We understand, however, that in many universities the academic reward system is exactly the opposite. Which is, it's, it's called reduce size of lake until I am biggest fish. <laughs> I think I struck a chord on that one. <laughs> Alright, real quick, how many, how many professors does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> one. They simply raise the bulb in the air and wait for the world to revolve around them. <laughs> Okay. All right, I'm not just a library, I'm not a library and information science professor, I'm a library science. Oh, library science is too big. I am a reference person. Oh, damn, there's Bop and Smith. I am a virtual reference person. Oh, no, now Marie Radford's doing that. Um, I am a systems, a virtual reference library. Until, by God, I am the world's leading expert in like virtual reference systems written in COBOL for a, a Commodore A64 machine or something. <laughs> Now I can become a full professor. Now I've done it. <laughs> this is, right? And what's interesting is look at how it's happened with the academy. The academy broke itself up into pieces. Your libraries, as I understand Cornell structure, is a result of this as well. We have balkanized around ourselves and we've broken Weber's bureaucracy model to the ultimate extreme where we begin to say, by understanding the smallest part of something and hopefully communicating that back up, we will understand something. But what happens is when you're so busy breaking things into bits and reductionism and you forget to put them back together. And now what you see is you see provost after provost after provost standing up and saying, the future of the academy is interdisciplinarity. And you see professor after professor in their little ponds going, what? <laughs> yeah, let's build a canal. You know? It doesn't work too well. And yet, I'm guessing, I'm, we're, we're in the what, biotechnology? 
I'm guessing this is a result of an interdisciplinary effort, right? We want biologists and technologists and computer scientists and simulation. And where's the money going? The money by God's going into interdisciplinary. <laughs> That's the job we're in. What, what's remarkable to me is that libraries are perfectly situated for this world. Perfectly situated for this world. Because think about it. We don't have the same investment in the small ponds. And our job as an organic institution is to serve them all. And as these professors come in and ask for assistance, and the students come in and ask for their assistance, we can begin to look and see trends across them. We're supposed to do this in collection development. By mapping out the conversations that happen in the academy and begin to looking at what resources go into those and how we can build on those resources, what we begin to do is we begin to provide the interdisciplinary connective tissue to the academy. And we are uniquely situated for that. We are more situated for that than any other institution on this campus. Computer, the, the, the computer technology group, no. You know, someone once said, we never let the cabinet builders organize the cards in the card catalog. Why are we letting computer technologists control website design? What do they know about it? Well, it's Ajax, who cares? I'm not an anti-web 2.0 person. I'm not an anti-web. I blog, I like wikis, I like all of this stuff. But they're answers to a question. We're in the question business, we're in the knowledge business. On a regular basis, we interact with people trying to de develop the next generation of the world. And we interact with them when they're engineers, and when they're physicists, and when they're chemists, and when they're writers, and when they're Russian language scholars, and whatever they are. And we can share. As librarians, we're taught the value of sharing and working together and building a team. And so every time the provost stands up and talks about the new interdisciplinary effort, cheer. But make sure that you're right at the table going, what can we do for you? What can your longest standing century plus interdisciplinary unit do to help you in this effort? What can we do to address the academic reward system? Let the professors go and make their small pawns. Frankly, it's how the world works, and until we change the reward system, it's going to be hard. Our reward system is the more people we can serve and the more connections we can make. We have the reward system for this new world. All right? So, back to Bill. What is the fundamental and recognizable contribution of library science? A cohesive set of skills and concepts that through action, now this is a really important one, fuse the intellectual work of the academy to improve the university and society. What's your unique contribution? Dewey, no. Dewey's a tool. What's your unique contribution? Books, no. Books are tools. I've said this at least three times today. Right? Comparing libraries, you know, equating librarians to books is like equating dentists to drills. It's what the public has foremost in their mind, yet is probably the smallest thing that we do and is a tool to our larger effort. And when we do our jobs really well, it's almost transparent. Right? When you walk out of a dentist's office and you don't have a cavity, who do you congratulate? Yourself. I brushed well today. Right? Forget about all like, the 12 pounds of gunk they were just scraping off your teeth. Right? Forget about the marketing effort they put into it. Forget about fluoride. Right? Forget about all this. It was you. And when an undergraduate walks out and they've got the perfect citation for the paper, God, am I good searching? <laughs> Man, that librarian wasn't holding me back for the last 15 minutes. I would have been done writing. Hmm? People look and they say that library science is not a science because we don't have a fundamental theory and a foundation to what we do. And I fear that they may be right. But I fear that we, and I, I hope that we can change it. This is my answer, which is, is, is conversation. And it has theoretical underpinnings and study and all that wonderful stuff. But it comes down to this word, which is we're not just going to sit and talk about this. We're going to try it. We're going to see if it works. And we're going to bring these groups together. And that binding and that bringing together is an intellectual contribution. It takes smarts to help people. It is not a clerical role that we perform. And it is a fundamental good to the university and to society. So my answer to that, why does LIS belong in the Ivy League? My answer is one, 
your ability to facilitate and enhance conversations within the academy. Not to store the stuff of the academy, not to catalog the stuff of the academy, not to be the caretakers of stuff. Who cares about stuff? Stuff is important, but only in the larger sense of the conversation. Facilitate and enhance. And facilitate doesn't mean transparent and evaporative. It means that you are an active partner in. To be a good facilitator, you must take a stand. Today, divorce, your con divorce yourself from the concept that librarian is somehow unbiased. There's no such thing as being unbiased. Biases are things built into our very being that help us work on the everyday world that we are in. We are a biased people. Right? Librarians, however, are smart enough to admit it and to work to mitigate it. But when you walk into an undergraduate class and you try and teach them the difference between a scholarly journal and what they found on Google, you have a bias. Right? Admit it. Right? Work with it. Right? Because good teachers have biases. What you are teaching is a way of life. You need to be visible and active and political animals in doing that. You need to have your ability to demonstrate your value. The days of saying, if you want your, your university accredited, you must have a library of X number of volumes per, per professor is dead. It's gone. We fought like hell to at least keep the fact you need a library in the accreditation, but even that's being challenged. And now to be accredited, it's what impact did this unit have on learning? What is your outcome? And if you want to know, did students learn better because they had a library, you better have some data coming back in from the students. Don't just be in Blackboard or whatever your, your course management system is. Suck data back out of Blackboard. Right? You're worried about professors depositing things in repositories. They upload them for their classes. Hey, well, while I'm here, right, let me grab it. Your ability to innovate from core principles. If we constantly attempt to chase Amazon and chase Google and chase Twitter and chase MySpace and chase whatever the flavor du jour is, because that's what's cool, that's where them kids are, what we will do is we will ultimately be chasing and the best, the best outcome that we could hope for is to be the second best whatever. Google always gets to be the best Google. Right? And what we need to do is understand what our core principles are because Google is not in the same business that we are. They're in the advertising business. Amazon is not in the same business that we are. They're in the thing business. They do have to sell things. We're in the knowledge business. The closest competitor that we have are the professors who work in the classrooms. If you want to play the competition game. right? That's the closest competitor we have because we're in the knowledge business and knowledge is learning, knowledge is conversation. Knowledge is no longer the brick and bucket approach. The brick and bucket approach is where you are all merely empty buckets and I throw bricks of knowledge from the stage hoping to make it in. Right? Why is it if we laugh at that and we look at, te at professors who try and do that in their classroom we say that's bad, that we turn around and pretend the idea of giving them access to a brick is any different? Right? Oh, here's the journal. I can't touch the journal because I may be biasing you in what journal you may read. Right? That's all we're doing is instead of tossing the bricks, we're laying them out gently for them to choose from. Right? That's not what we should be doing. We should be teaching. We should be in a learning business. We should be connecting. Because ultimately, it is the library that has the ability to reach into every tendril and every part of the academy and make it better. Why the Ivy League? Because the Ivy League has the resources and the sense and the mission to believe that it can change society. That we can be a great influence to make society better. And guess what? The librarians are the people who can make the Ivy League and society better too. That's the mission that we need to be in. We need to not shy away from the sense that we have a grand, noble, and glorious vision. And we need to innovate every day. Because the world is changing. And we can either be changed by it, or we can control the change. And I think that everyone in here needs to realize that your job is change agent. That your job is to look at not just what you're doing, but the entire organization's doing. When's the last time your library sat down and said, what is our vision of the library in 10 years? What is it going to look like? And why is it going to look like that? 
When you come up with a 10 year mission, is it because, well, Google's really cool, so it'll all look like Google in 10 years? Or is there some fundamental thing that when you approach a new tool, a new toy, a new exercise, a new experience, a new challenge, that you lean back and say, all right, if we're in the conversation business, this is why tagging makes sense or doesn't make sense, as opposed to, tagging's everywhere, let's do it. You guys are smarter than that. You guys have masters of library science. You have master's degrees. You have graduate education. You're supposed to have gone beyond trigonometry and basic functions and L0 operations into understanding what the conversation is. And you need to grab and drag the rest of the academy into your conversation. And you need to be at every one of their conversations saying, here's what I can do for you and here's the value I hold. And you can do that. And I'm going to shut up. I'm going to say thank you. <laughs>